Hello and welcome to this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lav. It was a surprisingly busy week in mid-September in the world of golf. And Rex, let's start first with the Solheim Cup and the U.S. team winning the Solheim Cup for the first time since 2017, trying to uh, trying to avoid losing four straight cups for the first time in tournament history. It was a week that began in Virginia with a transportation snafu, the likes of which we have never seen. And yet it ended uh, pretty dramatically, as it seemingly always does with the Solheim Cup. Goes to show that that event is the LPGA's crown jewel, and it must be protected and promoted at all costs. What was your takeaway from the week that was at RTJ? I'm going to push back a little bit. Transportation snafu that we've never seen, the likes of which we've never seen. Of the I, highest I'm, order. I'm pretty sure we've seen, if not just as bad than I would argue worse. I'll go back. I'll go back to Kiwa a few years ago. It was not a pretty scene for anyone. And that includes the media or anyone trying to get on that Island. Um, and they figured it out. I do want to give the LPGA credit. It, it was a stumble. I think you and I both referenced a stumble. Uh, they, didn't, it, they didn't, they didn't stumble. Whatever you they, want to call they tripped, it. Stumble. They, they, they smashed their face. They were bloodied. <laughs> they, they, they were, they were okay. rolling them off of the curb. I mean, it was, it was curb a stomped. horrible, Ow. it was a horrible situation where you had fans waiting two or three hours just to get the golf course. I mean, there could have been tens of thousands who were turned away and just said, forget this. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this. A PR nightmare, uh, a, a, a failure from the top level on down. And I recommend, I think both of us uh, had the same take. We both read our colleague, Beth Ann Nichols, column on this at golfweek.com. And she did a really good job of sort of breaking down why this was important and why this was, to use your words, a face plant. And I think that's probably a pretty good way of saying it because this is an opportunity for the LPGA. Next week or in two weeks, the President's Cup is an opportunity for the PGA Tour. The Ryder Cup is an opportunity for golf in general to grow the game beyond. We, we talk about this all the time, that we want – golf to be a mainstream sport but it seems like every time we start inching in that direction we end up shooting ourselves in the foot because this is a really good example of how were you not prepared for this they've had big tournaments at rtj before which is on the shores of lake manassas in case you didn't know that they've had big tournaments there before they know the logistics of that event they know how to get people in and out they know where to put grandstands all of the things have already been mapped out so I was a little surprised, but again, I was glad they turned it around. Probably my biggest takeaway, though, was the finish on Sunday. When you have a team, in this case the U.S. team, that has such a commanding lead, I think it was 10-6, to 6, going into Sunday's uh, singles matches, it, it's kind of easy to say, oh, it's over, and, and the glance by, and it also was an NFL Sunday, so it's hard to sort of keep your focus, if I'm being honest. But give the credit to the Europeans. I mean, they made it a match. And at the end of the day, I, I don't think the final score is indicative of how close it actually got coming down the stretch. It, it's always hard when you're trying to dig out of one of those holes on Sunday because you need so many things to fall your way. And probably the other part is, and look, I think this probably goes across the entire U.S. team, and, and we're going to get into a conversation about Stacey Lewis, but it's the emotions that we saw there. I covered the Olympics, and Nellie Corder was the focus of that Olympics. And everyone wanted to talk to her every single day. And I don't want to say the pressure got to her, but you can tell she had circled the wagons that particular week. She wasn't very chatty. She wasn't very emotional. She wasn't very outgoing. She was there with, with a mission, which, which I respect. And in this particular case, though, you can see how the team atmosphere brought the best out of Nelly. I mean, for her to go essentially dancing on to the first tee on Sunday morning to open up the matches, that was so much fun. Yeah, so many things uh, to get to here. You mentioned the final score being closer uh, than maybe the final score, or excuse me, the, the sort of the competition and the drama closer than the final score indicated. The final score, 15 and a half to 12 and a half. But heading into singles, it was that 10-6 margin. Every time you see a 10-6 margin, like that's golf's magic number, where that has been, uh, that deficit has been erased on the final day before. It's never been uh, bigger than that. And so your mind sort of goes to, oh, like who could potentially close out the match? Where are some trouble spots? Do you front load the lineup? Do you save it in case things go haywire uh, towards the end? Like I think the 10-6 margin just never fails. Like it, it almost always delivers because of the potential possibilities uh, for Sunday singles. I would bring up uh, first sort of this new look U.S. team. They only had a couple different returners uh, from 2023, but it seems like they've certainly turned the page in terms of who is on that roster now, Nelly Corda is the uh, undisputed alpha of that squad. But Rose Zhang went 4 0, didn't even see the 17th and 18th holes. It's the first time a player has ever done that on the US side, uh, just completely dominant and certainly redeemed herself after what was a pretty shaky uh, Solheim Cup debut that I covered in 2023. Laura Coughlin 
the uh, Virginia native who went three zero and one has continued. I, I think she's probably the best, the second best player in the world behind Nelly Quarter this year. You see the way that Lauren Coughlin has picked it up over the sex, uh, past six months, and Megan Kang. She uh, to me is like that Justin Thomas figure that we've seen so often on the uh, U.S. Uh, men's side, the emotional leader, and then she backs it up with substance, going 3-0, and undefeated for the second straight Solheim Cup. She isn't just sort of the spark plug Rex, like she's also backing it up with great play, with clutch approach shots, with timely putting. Uh, I love everything about Megan Kang when you get into the uh, competitive arena. What did you think of the discrepancy in the captaincies? The second time uh, in, the, in the past two years that we've seen Stacy Lewis go up against Suzanne Pedersen. Uh, Suzanne tied uh, on home soil last year. Uh, Stacy Lewis, a pretty resounding victory this time on home soil again, winning for the first time since 2017. What did you take away from her captaincy? Uh, I love Stacy's captaincy, and again, this was a conversation you and I were having offline before we jumped on here. The idea that she leaned so much into analytics, and I do find that fascinating because it seems to me on the men's side, certainly with the Presidents Cup with Jim Furyk, it, it, they don't have much interest. And when it comes to analytics, I'm sure they sort of glance over the spreadsheets and, and give it a good read or two, but it's mostly from gut. Like when I talked to Jim Furyk before he made his picks two weeks ago, it was I he, he didn't have anything to throw in my direction about someone he might pick because of X, Y and Z. It was always, well, how does he fit into the team room? How's the chemistry? What does my gut tell me? That's the entire that's the antithesis of what Stacey Lewis did. And I think that's really cool. I, I think Suzanne, it, it, to be fair. Stacy clearly had the better team. This is like asking me, and, and I'll put no. it. In, I'll, I'll put it in terms that you can understand. Anybody that plays Georgia is always going to think that Kirby Smart is a genius. He's only a genius because he has the best fifty-three players on the field more times than not. I can't think of the last time that they didn't. Probably last year's SEC championship. So I, I know it's still a sore subject oh. for you. Uh, I, I know you don't want to revisit that, but I kind of looked at it the same way, not to dismiss the European team. It's clearly a very, very talented team. But when you look on paper, as we always do before these matches, the United States team is clearly deeper, has more talent coming off the bench. And in that particular case, Stacey Lewis did a really good job of maximizing that. I, I mean, Europe, the European team did not win a single LPGA event this year. And so we can, you can break down pairings. You can look at the data. You can look at, um, you know, who's going to go where in Sunday singles. You can look at wild card selections and who's the automatic qualifiers. The fact of the matter is like, it still matters who is playing good golf heading into the matches. And it was indisputable what the Americans did. And I think we saw that with some of the player records over the three days at, at RTJ. This was basically an extension of what Stacey Lewis did last year. You mentioned uh, how heavily she leaned into the data and the analytics. She's been sponsored by KPMG for if not her entire career, the majority of her career, the data analytics team. She had our good friend, Justin Ray, uh, sort of in that backroom staff who was who was feeding her uh, information, who was sort of informing her pairings, who certainly uh, had a, a, a big say in who was actually going to be on that team uh, with her captain's picks. I, I think she and Stacey Lewis has changed the way Team USA views this. And you mentioned sort of Jim Furyk not being um, that heavy in this. I, I think there's clearly like a generational divide here. Jim Furyk, 54 years old. You look at Davis Love III, who's been in so many of these U.S. teams. He's 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Steve Stricker's 57 years old. Fred Couples is is north of 60. And so I think as... Paul Azinger being the outlier there in your conversation, yes. Yes, but he was even, even younger at that stage of his career when he accepted the captaincy back in 2008. Like, there's there's clearly a acceptance of the numbers, of the data, of the analytics, of those insights that that can provide that, uh, quite frankly, a player north of 50 just really hasn't needed in their career. They did it a different way. And now when you see the captaincy, it's it's important to put players who are on the team who can sort of fit with the golf course. And Justin Ray, uh, to hear him uh, in an interview, said he knew that the bread and butter of Team USA was going to be six, sevens, and eight irons. If we can have a team uh, comprised of, of, of mid iron hitters, that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted to set the golf club, uh, golf course up that way. If Europe had a bunch of wedges in his hands, that was going to be uh, their strength. And he wanted to stay away from that uh, as much as possible. I think that was certainly key, but I think it's even more important direction, like an interpersonal and a social aspect where Stacy Lewis was now able to share with her players, the pairings that they were going to have why they were going to have them 
and why certain players would be sitting out. I, I think it's so important for them to have a reasoning as opposed to just like, ah, eh, I don't think you're playing good or we've we've been using this for the last three or four cups. We're just going to keep sending them out there, which it seemed like Suzanne Pedersen has yeah. always relied on heart and guts and instincts as opposed to having like cold, hard facts of why you're doing something. And I think you saw that with the Team USA buying in. And on the opposite, you didn't see that for Europe. In, in particular, Leona McGuire, who has had a pretty forgettable 2024, but she and she uh, played just one uh, of the four team matches. And she tweeted on Sunday after winning her singles match that form is temporary, but class is permanent. That was a player who did not understand why she played just a single team match. And then uh, clearly afterward was a little bit miffed at the lack of reasoning and um, sort of rationale behind why she sat on the bench for so often. So I think, I think that just goes to show how important data and analytics could be, but also the captain and yeah. how that can really benefit the relationships that you can have with the players. No, I, I think you're right. This is less about trying to explain to certain players why you're going to play here with this person or why you're going to go here in the Sunday singles lineup, whatever it might be. The more difficult part is to try to tell them in a way that's going to keep them focused. It's going to keep them moving in the right direction with the rest of the team while you're sitting out the Saturday afternoon foursomes session. I, I'll go back to, and, and they brought this up in the post game show, Brando Chambly was talking about the idea that the way Stacy was able to sort of check every box. There was not a stone that she left unturned. It reminded her of both Paul Azinger and our colleague, Paul McGinley. And he went back to that Ryder Cup when it was Graham McDowell who was going to sit on Saturday afternoon. And he was actually playing really well. But Paul got in Graham's face and explained to him, I have to have you at your absolute best on Sunday because you're going to be in a crucial position in this lineup. So I need you to be fully rested. It gets the players bought in. Whether if that was true or not, it got him bought in and decided that, yep, this is what I need to do for the team, and I'm going to make the most of it. And I think she did a really good job of that as well. Masterclass by Stacey Lewis. Again, I think it just oodles uh, of pressure will be on Jim Furyk to uh, justify the captain's picks that he made uh, for Montreal, as well as making sure that the pairings and the order are exactly what he wants. Because I think you're going to see uh, quite a different strategy from Jim Furyk next week at the President's Cup. Let's talk about the second biggest story of the week that was. That was John Rahm winning the individual championship on Live Golf. Pretty uh, pretty compelling leaderboard, if we're being honest. John Rahm, Joaquin Neiman, Sergio Garcia, Brooks Kepka all in the mix at Live Chicago. It's John Rahm who wins, wraps up the uh, Live individual title. What did you make of this? Was this validation for his move? Does this uh, sort of change the way that you view his 2024 does it all matter? Where do you kind of fall on this? Yeah, I was wondering where you were going to go with that. Like the second biggest story of the week could have been. It was, not, the blank it was not the it was not the pro core championship. Uh, it was not the pro core championship. I was going to go uh, maybe lean towards Irish Open, but I, I think I agree with you. I think it was John Rahm for the reasons you just pointed out, because we have spent all season picking apart that decision. And it was based entirely on what he did in the major championships, maybe a little bit of what he did at the Olympics when, of course, he melted down on that Sunday. And you start picking it apart. I still think there is part of this argument or part of this conversation that can apply to John, that maybe the move to live golf wasn't best for him to perform at his best when it matters the most in golf. That's not a diss to live golf or the PGA Tour. The majors matter the most. And as we've seen throughout the course of his career, he kind of likes to play with an edge. He likes to play maybe with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and maybe 54 hold shotgun starts and shorts with loud music isn't for him. That still remains to be seen. It's a pretty small sample size up until this point. We're, we're going to base that entirely on what he did in the major championship this year, this year. But when you watch what he did this weekend, and not only does he win the individual title, but he does it rather convincingly, I would say, with a really, really good finish in Chicago. And as I'm sort of reading the recap story this morning, and I think data golf is pretty much the only place we can go now. And he's squarely third in the world. When you look at it, it's he's behind Scotty and he's behind Xander. And they're all sort of right there close when it comes to the strokes game, the way they do their strokes game for the rankings. I was like, yeah, that seems about right. That as much as for the last year, we, maybe the rural we, have tried to put our head in the sand and pretend like, oh, well, we have no way of knowing how they're performing on Live Golf. We have no standard to compare this. I, I think that ship has sailed because as you pointed out, it was a really good leaderboard. I mean, Joaquin Neiman has been a solid player all year long. Brooks Kepka was right in the mix. Uh, Bryce DeChambeau wasn't too far back. So you have to give hats off to John for winning that title. I still don't buy the reasoning that the 54 holes, the shotgun start, the music, the shorts, like I still don't buy that that is not 
the best preparation. That's why John Rahm was a little bit sluggish in the major championships this year. I think it probably more has to do, Rex, with the venues that Live Golf chooses and the locale that Live Golf chooses heading into the major championships. But I think that's something, if this is going to be uh, you know, a part of our golfing lives for the next decade plus, that's something they're really going to have to look at to make sure that they're putting uh, their players in the best possible situation to prepare uh, for the major championships. And that's by playing difficult golf courses that are going to put a lot of stress on them, that they're sort of going to have to emulate the shots that they're going to have to play. I think the caliber of fields now uh, on live is something that you're, you're no longer scoffing at, but, but going to these far flung locales like Australia or Singapore or Hong Kong or Saudi Arabia, leading them to the masters is probably not the best way to prepare for a major championship, make sure they're playing the absolute best tests they possibly can. I do think overall sort of 30,000 foot view of this. I, I think this was probably confirmation that we were too quick to judge John Rahm's season. Keep in mind, his swing was not in a good place. He had not won a tournament worldwide wreck since the 2023 masters. And I think you saw a notable change in his performance an uptick in his performance. As soon as he made the driver shaft change following the PGA championship, you look at his results. He just finished uh, the live golf season one, two, one, including a playoff loss. Uh, he was also healthy. At, 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 let's, at, let's put at health at in this as well. yeah. He was healthy. He didn't have the foot issue. Uh, keep in mind, he's uh, sort of coupled that with the difficult pregnancy that his wife Kelly has had at home. Uh, she's sort of been on bed rest uh, post Masters in April. I think it's it's impossible to say how much that affected him mentally, but we have a large enough sample size now with John Rahm's career to know that this was an outlier. The 52 yeah. weeks where he did not perform well uh, is an outlier based on his uh, career record. And so I do think that it played a large factor. This is the job Rom that we've come to expect. This is the job Rom who I would expect to play well in the major championships in 2025, regardless of which tour he's going to be affiliated with. And I will say the story behind that, which I did not understand this morning. is So the way it worked out is their, their relegation system came to a head this week. So Bubba Watson, who is a team captain, he was uh, in that drop zone, whatever it is you want to call it. He should be relegated. But according to the small print I saw, but because he's a captain, he can make a compelling argument to the board of his team. And so my mind immediately went to, first off, who's on the board? It is like his. I have so many questions. It was like his, it's like basically like his business partner. And keep in mind, Bubba Watson's range goats are among the more popular live golf teams. Everything that I've read from our colleague Bob Herrig at Sports Illustrated and other venues said it's it's a mere formality that Bubba Watson is going to be brought back because of the quote compelling business reason to have him a part of the team. I, I actually did want to get into this because this this sort of stood out about the live regular season finale is that you did have regulation. Among the Vincent brothers, you had Bubba Watson, who's in the drop zone. Callie Samuja is going to be relegated. Brandon Grace. Uh, Pat Perez he, was saved at the last minute. He, yes, he was it, was, the, it was interesting. Yes. And so those players either have to go through the Live uh, Promotions event at the end where they're going to hand out a couple of Live cards, or they're going to have to go sort of to the Asian tour and try and get back on Live that way uh, through the order of merit. I really think, and Bubba Watson is a perfect example of this, that Live would benefit by being more transparent with these player contracts and who's up, who isn't, who has certain clauses in their contracts. Like this is like being a fan of let's say the Kansas city chiefs. And it's, it's completely blind about what the player contract status are. You have, you don't have no idea if Patrick Mahomes is signed to a five-year deal or if he's going to be up in December, you don't know about Travis Kelsey or Rashi Rice. Like, if you, if you look at it from that sort of perspective, if this is supposed to be a team model, it's insane that there's not more transparency to know how much these players are getting paid, how long their contracts are, and if there is a possibility like Bubba Watson that you could be even brought back into the fold because of a business reason. It clearly wasn't performance reasons. He was one of the five or six worst Liv players oh, yeah. this season. But I think, I think Liv loses credibility, and I think there's sort of untapped potential when you look at this team model – to not have the transparency that they probably should in this in this situation. Well, and before I get at it, I, I want to point out, like I, I want to give Liv Goff their flowers, certainly John Ron, his flowers for all season long. We've been watching with a microscope and he ended up having a pretty good season on that tour. The flip side of it is, yes, it's ridiculous. The point you brought out, it's the transaction. I think that most of us looked at the, at least the model of Liv Goff and thought, yeah, 
I could be interested in that because of the reasons you just said. I have two really, really bad fantasy football teams, but it's the transaction that keeps me interested week in and week out because I'm never going to win anything. So I'm just trying to, to, to find a way to make this happen. In this particular case, yeah, I'd love to know what's Bubba's contract. And I understand bringing him back. Like, I'm not against that at all. He probably sells a lot of hats, if I'm being quite frank on this front. But I, I like to know all of these things. They could leverage this so much better than what they're doing right now. Yeah, it's just so confusing, and it just seems like an own goal. Where if Brooks Kepke's got a four-year deal worth $200 million, and Paul Casey's got a three-year deal worth $60 million, like, that's cool. Have that out in the open. Understand. Mm -hmm. Move the contracts around. Trade players for a 2025 promotions uh card like who who knows who cares i think if if live golf really wants to get serious about this team model more transparency more openness more accountability is something that absolutely has to come to fruition one player rex will not be in dallas for the team championship who i did want to get into who was clearly a focus of a couple of pods uh, earlier this year was anthony kim was one of the worst players on live golf this year uh, his strokes gained numbered were minus 3.4 strokes gained to the field per round. That was actually better. He actually got better as the year went on. But if you look at that uh, in totality, he would not have made cuts on PJ Tour, European Tour, Corn Ferry Tour. Playing like that, Anthony Kim uh, would have been hard-pressed to make cuts on the European Challenge Tour. Uh, he was brought on to live as a one-year wildcard player could be brought back again as a wild card player in 2025. Could, uh, I guess, theoretically, sign with a team like Dustin Johnson's in 2025. If you're Liv, what do you do with Anthony Kim? Well, you already missed the boat, I think. And this goes back to when he played in that first event. I believe it was in Spain was his first event back. And you could have turned this into something really compelling. Because, again, at the time, I think I called him Bigfoot. I mean, he had been cited in public only in grainy photographs. I mean, it, the rumors about where what happened to the legend of Anthony Kim had been going on for a decade now. I mean, there was a generation of golf fans who were really interested in, wow, what have you been doing, man? Like, where you been? Like, <laughs> catch us up. Fill me in on what's been happening. And they did a really, really poor job of that. And like listening to some of the interviews that Anthony did sort of after the fact, I think part of that was driven by him. I don't think he's really in a place where he wants to talk about much of this right now. But that was the opportunity to capitalize on, let's be frank, you were bringing this guy out of retirement because you wanted more eyeballs. And that's what Liv Goff has done well in some circles at, at doing and then done really, really poorly at some circles. They missed the boat on it. You can bring him back, but I, I think sort of the nostalgia of Anthony Kim is worn on. Yeah. I, I mean, it's amazing how quickly people. Well, he didn't play well. I, I don't think it's that's, so. Yeah. He that's that's the well. thing. I, I mean, he didn't crack the top half of any live event this season. His best finish was 36. We would just went through the strokes gain numbers and how that would sort of match up on any other tour. Like he was basically irrelevant on his own tour. And that's exactly what you don't want. If you're a wild card player, I think live is in a very difficult position because this is clearly a player who they brought out of hibernation. Uh, there was so much intrigue around him. He did not play well, but he seems at least from the outside to be doing all the right things. If you follow him on Instagram, like he's clearly putting in the work, he's putting in the time. He seems to, at least uh, when he's not making political po posts, um, sort of saying how much this has impacted his family, how grateful he is uh, for the opportunity, how uh, mental health has been such a challenge for him over the past couple of years. And he's in a better spot. Like it's hard to leave that guy out in the cold with nowhere to play professionally. But from a performance standpoint, from a results standpoint, from a credibility standpoint, like it's hard to see Anthony Kim on a live roster in 2025. I, I applaud him for the strides he has made throughout the 2024 season, basically cutting his strokes gain numbers in half. But there is still so far to go from where Anthony Kim is right now to being not even just a top level player on live, just being a competent player on live. That's the hardest sort of transition to make. It's not from going to from 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 bad to, you know, below average. Now it's from going below average to average or even above average. Though It's going to be so hard to do at his age with so much miles that he's put on his body. Well, and, and to your point, I think everything that he's gone through in his life is, is an interesting story. It's a story that should provoke 
some sort of compassion out of all of us because what he's gone through, a lot of it's self-inflicted, but a lot of it hasn't been. I mean, if you kind of go back and this goes back to the story I wrote about him, his rookie year on the PGA tour, he had a really, really rough childhood with, with a dad who wasn't a great person when it comes to being a dad. So all of those things you have to factor in, but you also have to factor in live fields are already so small and the microscope is already on that tour for not really having the relegation and promotion that at least the world ranking feels like they should have. So to have a player like Anthony Kim taking up one of those valuable spots is probably not the best, let's say, optics. Yeah, I mean, he could certainly be brought back as a wild card. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he signs on with Dustin Johnson's team for 2025. They just go completely DGAF. Uh, that remains to be seen. Again, Anthony Kim will not be in Dallas for the team championship because he is not part of a team. The third biggest story of the week, Rex, is Roy McIlroy. At the Irish Open, Royal County Down completely shined. It's exactly what we thought. Like this was a reminder that we need to have golf courses of this caliber on the professional tours year in and year out. Bring the best players to the best venues. It does not matter where in the world we will tune in because it's so spectacular. But Roy McIlroy, as it seemingly has gone in 2024, was pipped at the end. Just a crushing three putt on the 71st hole. Hits the lip with his eagle putt on 18 after two spectacular shots. Was this more the same from Rory? How much do you think this one will sting not bringing it home in front of the home fans? I mean, this one's going to sting for a long time. It's not going to be Pinehurst sting. I don't think he's going to be wandering around New York City with his earbuds, earbuds in over the next <laughs> few days. He's won this event before. I know this was going to be a little bit different because it's so close to where he grew up in Belfast. And and I get there was a lot of heartstrings. And again, this goes back to what we did on the podcast last week when my best moment of the year was when Robert McIntyre won the Scottish Open. And it was because it meant the world to him. Like winning a major is always going to stand above. But for so many players, winning their national open really means something. You go back to Nick Hardy at the Canadian Open last year. I mean, that was one of the best moments of the year. So I, this one's going to sting for a while. I'm not quite sure if it's going to resonate the way the U.S. Open did. I will say that the most disturbing part for me is, and I'm not sure what I expected him to answer. Well, the fact he actually answered, talked to reporters after the round is an indication of how this one's probably not going to sting the way Piners did. But the idea, and he quote said, I'm getting used to it. Now that, that disturbs me a little bit because you don't want, no, no, I don't want you to get used to this. Like this isn't what I want at all. Uh, you have to give him credit for putting himself in contention. And I see where he's trying to take the glass half full Avenue, but man, it's tough. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants this year to be over more than Rory. Yeah, just a really tough, three months just continually kicked right in the groin i would love for roy McIlroy just to just to have a reset just to take like three or four months off of golf reset maybe make some changes like brandle's been harping on the fact that he needs to change like the top of backswing position if he wants to be more consistent with his wedge play and that is is such the biggest difference right now between roy McIlroy and where scotty scheffler is and there's just too much variance. There's too much volatility in Roy McIlroy's game. And making that change, according to Brandel, would be huge. To do that, you need to have dedicated time off. And I think Roy has, what, four more events in 2024, including this BMW, week, the BMW, PGA, BMW, Dunhill, PGA Championship, which is this week yeah. at, at Wentworth. And then, of course, he's playing in the Made for TV event with Scotty Scheffler, Brooks Kepka, and Bryce Nishambo in December. Like, I want to see a full-blown reset from Roy. I want him to go seek some mental help with with either Bob Rotella, Julie Elion, whoever the case may be, like get him in the proper frame of mind to go absolutely berserk in 2025 because that's what exactly what we want to see from Roy McIlroy uh, this year. Again, a very disappointing situation with how it played out at the Irish Open, uh, but that is sort of uh, more of the same, certainly over the past couple months for Roy. Anything from Napa? Stand out. The final event, Rex, before the PGA Tour uh, has the uh, President's Cup. Uh, Mackenzie Hughes, Sahith Thagala, Corey Connors, all top 10. Max Homa missed the cut in his final tune-up. What stood out, if anything, about Patton Kazire in his five-shot win at Silverado? Again, this is going to be piling on. Max Homa hit half his fairways for two days after missing the cut. But he actually gained strokes to Somehow. the field. I mean, those those fairways are incredibly difficult to hit. I actually thought that was somewhat. I th thought that was somewhat encouraging for Max Homa. He was still in better position than a lot of uh, his peers on that golf course. His iron play let him down. Uh, terrible. He was four of uh, eleven for scrambling and missed the cut once again. If you're Jim Furyk, he absolutely cannot see more than what one 
maybe two team matches over the first couple of days. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I mean, it, you always look at Patton. You talk about trying to get mental help for Roy McIlroy. I, I did find it interesting, Patton talking yesterday about all of the things he's been working on. Probably the one thing in the six years it's been since he had won on the PGA Tour last time is just mentally. He had to become a better player. He had to become stronger. He had to be more focused when he was on the golf course. And you saw that out of him, which is fun because you and I have watched Patton since he joined the PGA tour. And there was so much talent there, especially with his hands or short game putting wise, but for him to go almost seven years between victories is pretty shocking when you consider how much talent is there. And, and I always am interested when a player like Patton, and he said this, that he felt like he's been underachieving because it's such a, like, it is such, you have to tiptoe around players. If you and I were going up to a player and I've done this before and got my head beat bitten off, you just can't come up and say, have you, have you underachieved Davis love? Have you underachieved in your career? I asked that very, very early in my career and got my head bit off for all the right reasons. I mean, he was not having it. Most players are not willing to go down that road. And for him to do that shows how much mentally stronger he is. Uh, probably the highlight for me, though, was Mac Hughes. Because I feel like from Mike Weir's point of view, the captain of the International Presidents Cup team, that was probably a bit of a flyer considering all the Canadians he, he had to choose from for those last kind of few picks. He probably wasn't the one that was standing out on a lot of people's list. And so for him to have a solid week this week is probably a shot in the arm for Mike. Oh, I, I completely agree. I think Mackenzie Hughes, not just playing at home in his first uh, President's Cup, but sort of uh, justifying or validating Mike Weir's trust and faith in him over Nick Taylor, over an Adam Hadwin, players uh, who potentially had better at 2024s than Mackenzie Hughes did. I think this was an encouraging sign. Again, I still think Mackenzie Hughes was the right pick for that team uh, based on his short game and his putting prowess. You have a couple of tee times ahead of you uh, this week. You and I will be on golf today uh, about 1 o'clock Eastern time on Monday, uh, banding around, no doubt, the exact same topics we just touched on uh, on this podcast. But tell the people at home, what do you have coming up for these next couple of days? I ask for forgiveness and understanding because when we do this podcast a few days from now on Wednesday afternoon, I will have played one, two, three, five rounds of golf between Monday oh. morning and Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I will be a broken, battered, uh, sunburnt, and probably very, very sad man by that time. But I'm going out to Stream Song Resort, which is here in Central Florida. It's kind of hard to explain where people are. It's essentially right between Orlando and Tampa. I think you've been out there before, haven't you? I have. And so they have, well, they've had three courses uh, out there and they're all very, very good. Uh, the red is my favorite, but they just opened up a new one called the chain, which is a 19 hole course. And it's sort of one, a match play course. So there's no par, there's no tee markers. If you and I are in a match, we walk to the first tee, we play it, whatever the yardage is. And then if you win, you get to decide we can play the second hole from 90 yards or 300 yards and everything in between. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, that will certainly uh, be a great trip. I'm sure you're paying full freight sure. uh, on all of those, <laughs> all those rounds of golf. Uh, I must say, Rex, the next podcast record is probably TBD at this point. On Wednesday, I'll be in Stanford, Connecticut at our annual uh, NBC Sports feature meeting where we'll be kicking around some ideas for what you're going to see uh, TV feature-wise in 2025. If anyone has any great ideas, anything you'd like to see TV feature-wise, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, we did a long one a couple of years ago about uh, Sam Bennett this year. Eric Van Royen was sort of our uh, big one. They're the six, seven, eight minute long sort of college oh, game day esque features that Tom Rinaldi uh, became famous for. Uh, please, Sausage Finger, uh, put that down. If anyone has uh, any good ideas for that, uh, put them in the comments below. Find me on Twitter, even though I no longer tweet at, at Ryan Labner GC. I will be sure to find it. That's what we'll be doing on Wednesday. And we will not be recording Rex uh, next uh, Sunday. Or Monday. That is because I'm going to Buffalo, New York for the Buffalo Bills, Jacksonville Jaguars Monday night football game in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Got a group of about 25 to 30 uh, friends and family who will be e eating just uh, uh, dozens of wings, uh, pounding several light beers. It's going to be a great time in which I will surely watch the Jags uh, go to 0 and 3. But please, uh, the floor is yours uh, for the final comment of this podcast. Oh, I'd like to see an Anthony Kim feature. That's what I was going to volunteer. No? Can that be uh, I enough? believe uh, I don't think that one's going to fly. Uh, I also believe wasn't Apple working on a documentary? 
about Anthony King? Uh, there is a there is a documentary being made by him. Actually, Sean Foley's brother, the Sean Foley, the swing coach on the PGA Tour, his brother uh, does documentaries. And from what I've been told, it's completed and it's very good. There, uh, they they don't want to release it quite yet. Don't know why, but it will be interesting when it comes out. So yes, uh, then if we're not going to do the pod on Wednesday, then be kind to me next time you see me because I'll still be a broken man. <laughs> better better than broken. Look forward to seeing you in Montreal. We'll have a full review of Joe Beef, uh, one of the best steaks I've ever had. Ooh. Rex and I have a dinner reservation there uh, Wednesday of President's Cup week. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lab. You guys know the drill. MCSports.com slash golf. We have so much on the website right now about the Solheim Cup that was recently completed in which we touched upon on this podcast. Keep in mind the BMW PJ Championship. Also this week, the flagship event of the DP World Tour. We'll have coverage of that event as well on the site. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the support.